March 11th, 2011, 2.46 p.m. A powerful earthquake shakes Japan. It unleashes towering tsunami that devastate the northeast coast and send a nuclear plant spiraling out of control. Newsline has brought you stories of those who lost loved ones, of the struggle to rebuild communities and lives. People have made progress, but the road ahead is still long. Path to Recovery, three years on. People across Japan will pause on Tuesday to mark the third anniversary of the quake and tsunami. They'll honor the more than 18,000 people killed by the disaster and its lingering impact, and the roughly 2,600 people still considered missing. They'll also reflect on the continuing crisis at the nuclear plant in Fukushima. The work to decommission the facility is still in its early days and will stretch on for years. NHK World's Catherine Kobayashi is standing by about 20 kilometers from Fukushima Daiichi. Catherine. Yuko, I'm at the strategic base for the decommissioning of the plant's reactors. The thousands of workers involved in decommissioning the nuclear plant come through this facility every day. Now, TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company, operates it. This place is called J Village. And as I explain in just a moment, this facility was originally meant for a completely different purpose. Yuko? All right, thank you very much there, Catherine. We'll get back to you soon. First, let's take a look at how events unfolded at Fukushima Daiichi three years ago. A magnitude 9 earthquake triggered a gigantic tsunami off the coast of northeastern Japan. They knocked out all power sources and backup generators at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear complex, causing meltdowns in three reactors. Firefighters and self-defense force personnel were sent in to help stabilize the situation. The damaged reactors released enormous amounts of radioactive substances, contaminating vast areas both on land and at sea. Three years on, a large area around the plant remains uninhabited. Here's the layout of evacuation zones. In this area, shown in red, radiation exposure levels remain at least 50 times above the limit for the civilian population. The zone remains off-limits. In orange areas, residents are allowed to visit their homes during the day, but they are not allowed to stay overnight. And radiation levels are comparatively low in the yellow areas. These zones are being decontaminated to allow evacuees to return. The total number of evacuees from these areas stands at 81,000. The nuclear accident also dealt a heavy blow to Fukushima's main industries, particularly fishing. The government adopted strict standards on radiation levels in seafood. They prevent fishermen from selling their catch if radioactive particles exceed 100 becquerels per kilogram. Shipments of seafood from Fukushima Prefecture only 2% of what they were before the disaster. Agriculture was also seriously affected by the accident. It remains at a standstill in evacuation zones, but the situation has improved outside those areas. Farmers there are once again able to ship their products after testing them for radiation. The volume of shipments is now back to about 80% of pre-disaster levels. Let's turn now to the situation at the nuclear plant itself. After the accident, Tokyo Electric Power Company built a system to inject cooling water into the reactor cores. The utility says the fuel that melted down is now stable. But the water used to cool it becomes highly contaminated. And it's constantly accumulating in the basements of the compound. To prevent this water from overflowing and polluting the ocean, workers are storing it in hundreds of tanks. Thousands of workers are mobilized every day to decommission the plant. In many areas, they have to cope with very high levels of radiation. Now, for more on that, let's go back to Catherine at J Village. Catherine. 
Few people outside of Japan have heard of this facility, but as you know, Yuko, it's played a crucial role during the nuclear crisis. The J in J Village stands for Japan. It was built 17 years ago as the country's first national training center for soccer players. Now, take a look behind me at the parking lot. That used to be one of many soccer pitches here. One of the obvious traces left nowadays is the floodlights. The ground has been covered with gravel to make space for hundreds of vehicles. Now, Japanese leaders considered several factors when choosing this location and converting it to a major staging area for the decommissioning of the nuclear plant. The first was the location. This facility sits right on the edge of the 20-kilometer evacuation zone, and it's on the main road that leads directly to the nuclear plant. Self-defense force personnel and firefighters used that road right after the accident when they went in to help bring the situation under control. They used heavily armored vehicles to approach the reactors and fire trucks to douse the units with water. Now, another factor that they considered when converting this place into a major staging area for the decommissioning process was the amount of space, both indoors and out. J Village is huge. It's a 50-hectare property with 12 soccer fields. That means plenty of level ground for supplies and equipment. It's hard to imagine, Yuko, that just a few years ago, soccer fans came here to watch their national players train. Even the main stadium is completely different. The stands are still there, but the pitch has been converted to accommodate dormitories for the workers. 600 of them live here now. The clock on the scoreboard stopped right after the earthquake struck. And that's when J Village ceased to function as a sporting venue. Yuko? I see. So how has the facility's role changed over the past three years, Catherine? Well, the frontline tension that prevailed here in the early days of the crisis has subsided for the most part. The function of the facility has evolved in step with the situation at Fukushima Daiichi, and it's now a key part in managing what's become a long-term project. Work at the plant begins every day at dawn. As many as 2,000 workers report for duty at J Village. They board buses for the 40-minute ride to Fukushima Daiichi. After this point, access to the plant is severely restricted and only vehicles with a special permit can get in. J Village has become a crucial base for our operations at Fukushima Daiichi. TEPCO officials say they want to protect the privacy of contract workers, so you won't see their faces or hear from them directly. These workers have received encouragement from at home and abroad. The walls of the facility are covered with messages of support. During the day, J Village becomes a training center. Fresh recruits must attend different types of lectures. They learn about the dangers of radiation and how to minimize their exposure. Here, trainees find out how to properly wear a gas mask. More than 700 people entered this program over the past month. TEPCO also uses J Village to track every worker's cumulative exposure to radiation. They undergo regular checkups with a device called a whole body counter. The sensors can detect the presence of radioactive particles inside the body. They measure what's referred to as internal exposure. The screen says the results are normal. We also have more detailed figures. If the device detects an abnormally high level of radioactive particles, the worker goes immediately to hospital for further evaluation. Decommissioning the plant will take between 30 and 40 years. Failure to treat the worker's health as a top priority could compromise the entire operation. And Yuko, that operation is unprecedented and dangerous. I see. And as the TEPCO official has been telling you, worker safety obviously is a top priority there. But the levels of radiation are lethal in some places inside the plant. How do they strike a balance? 
Good question, Yuko. Well, it's impossible for humans to examine the reactors directly due to the high levels of radiation in some areas of the plant, as you just mentioned. So engineers are working to develop technology that will get them inside without the risk. NHK World's Noriko Okada explains. Right after the accident, TEPCO engineers sent a remote-controlled robot inside one of the reactor buildings. The device detected tremendously high levels of radiation, and it managed to make it out. Since then, TEPCO has used several robots to survey dangerous areas at the crippled plant. The utilities need for the technology has pushed developers to design robots that can go where humans cannot. Researchers and engineers are trying to make devices that can carry out more advanced decommissioning tasks. Some attended a convention in January. They are now focused on designing robots that can do decontamination work. This robot uses a laser technology to clean up the radioactive substances. The arm stick out of the device emits the beam. The laser can evaporate radioactive substances. Then the robot uses a vacuum to collect the radioactive dust. This model is designed to cut through rubble, which is littered inside reactor buildings because of the explosions. We're proud of this robot, which will be used in areas inside Fukushima Daiichi where no people can go. The most daunting challenge is removing extremely radioactive nuclear fuel from the damaged reactors. TEPCO officials say molten fuel burned through the damaged reactors and piled up at the bottom of the containment vessels. The fuel is inaccessible right now. Engineers are exploring ways to reach it. They are trying to develop a 30-meter-long robotic arm. It would have special sensors inside that would create a 3D picture, so engineers could monitor its movements. Radiation could affect all electronic parts of the robot, so we have to overcome that hurdle. This institute is developing a laser for the robotic arm. Teams of engineers are working on one that would slice through the melted-down nuclear fuel which is now extremely hard. They also need the laser to work underwater. The reactors must be filled with water to shield the emission of radiation from the fuel. The institute ran an experiment using a mock reactor. The engineers injected gas into water to clear a path for the laser so the beam wouldn't weaken. Then, they aim the laser at the simulated fuel and manage to cut some of it. But the fuel at the Fukushima plant is expected to be more difficult to deal with. Some of it mixed with debris when it melted down, making it much harder than the simulated fuel. TEPCO engineers don't fully understand the condition it's in. This is a huge challenge. We have to combine techniques in ways that we have never tested before. Some combinations will work, but in other cases, we will have to make fundamental adjustments. There are still many hurdles. Engineers haven't figured out how to collect and remove the fuel. And TEPCO workers would need to carry out the job in three reactors. For now, they know the technology they need is a long way away from being put into practice. Noriko Okada, NHK World. It's been three years since the accident, but in many ways we're still in the early stages of the recovery effort.